Right, here is another absolutely spectacular place to come and read and uh, of my selection of places round and about this area this is one of my favourites because uh, you can hear the sound of the sea and at the same time you see people playing golf and the particular combination is relevant to the subject of this particular book here which is an old favourite of mine, I don't know how many times I've read it, probably half a dozen I would think over the years and parts of it I've read a hundred times in fact one little bit, the one I'm going to end up reading I can almost recite by heart and this book is also interesting because it has a Russia dimension it may surprise some people to learn that the subject of this book Ian Fleming and this is a particularly well written biography of a literary figure and very often they're not all that well written but this one is and the reason is because he allows his imagination to roam a little bit and give us a real interpretation of Ian Fleming's character. It's written by John Pearson, a well-known uh, journalist who worked very briefly with Ian Fleming. He was very junior when Ian Fleming was nearing the end of his career in Fleet Street. He had, as it were, touched the hem of greatness and therefore he can write about it with what I think always is slightly greater authority. If you've met the person, um, you know, a thousand times more than somebody who's studied all the documents and never met them. And the first one is Ian Fleming's first of his two visits to Moscow, uh, being the Reuters correspondent as an absolutely novice reporter. He did so well. He was a natural reporter, basically because he was a natural conspirator and he thought of things in a different sort of way from the ordinary reporters because he had imagination. People wonder where Ian Fleming's imagination came from and I personally am persuaded by John Pearson's argument that it has something to do with his family's uh, Scottish and particularly Celtic background. His, his great-grandfather was a native Gaelic speaker his grandfather was one who founded the bank, Fleming's Bank, um, but they came from Dundee. They had a very Scottish background, which Ian Fleming very often kind of semi-referred to, and, 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 and John Pearson emphasises, and I think he's right, because the Celtic imagination with uh, horrors and monsters and all that is very different from the Anglo-Saxon imagination in my humble opinion, if you could, to the extent you can generalise. But anyway, it's illustrated in Fleming's case. John Pearson emphasises Fleming's imaginative approach to reporting, which of course these days would be totally uh, disallowed because we live in a, in a, in a Protestant, uh, Anglo-American, prosaic world as far as the media is concerned. There's no market for the kind of insight that Fleming had. Fleming is there to report on what was called the Metro Vic trial and I won't give all the background because it's all contained in chapter 2 of my book The Justice Factory which is a very detailed examination of this extremely interesting case of a whole lot of employees of the Metropolitan Vickers Company and as a way of diverting attention from the famine that was breaking out in the Ukraine and those sort of areas in Russia the bread producing areas uh, as Stalin tried to crush the kulaks and in fact kill everybody with any kind of uh, history of independent initiative. In, indeed he um, ended up causing the death of between six and ten million people. More than the Holocaust. I've been to the Holodomor as the Ukrainians call it museum in Kiev and it's a very impressive museum although frankly understates the horror of the thing. Anyway they organized this trial of these people who supposedly had been sabotaging five-year plan machinery that Russia had bought from Metropolitan Vickers to power things like the Dnieper Dam and so on and um, they were accused of sabotage and this was a way of Stalin explaining to the people by indirect means why things weren't going as they should. It's all due to those dirty foreigners. Fleming, with all the other foreign correspondents, got there. They stayed in the National Hotel, which was the hotel that Lenin stayed in, a, sort of the most prestigious hotel in Moscow. 
And this is Fleming's approach to facts. And I think as a journalist, this is highly, highly significant. Pearson says, in the final days before the trial opened, the foreign correspondents began to dry up. They had exhausted the rumours and there were no hard facts. It was at this point that Fleming demonstrated two of his advantages over the old Moscow hands of the National Hotel. Fresh from Britain, he understood better than they how avid newspaper readers at home were for information about Moscow and also had a curiously ingenious imagination which could suggest danger and conspiracy in the most humdrum of circumstances. How very Scottish is that? Tonight, he wrote as he sat at his typewriter in his big bedroom on the sixth floor, hammering out his first Moscow dispatch for Reuters. Tonight, thousands of enemies of the Soviet state are skulking in cellars, gnashing their teeth. When he showed the report to King Kidd, a young American uh, colleague that he palled up with, and asked him to put it on the wire to London, the startled resident correspondent of Reuters, that's King Kidd, pointed out that even if these skulking enemies really did exist, it was a positive fact that few houses in Moscow possessed cellars. My dear fellow, replied Fleming cheerfully, don't let's worry too much about that. It's the sense of the thing that matters, and evildoers always gnash their teeth and skulk in cellars. Another f story he sent off again with the knowledgeable line, and I think this is so good, when the big hands of Moscow's 300 electric clocks reach the hour of six. How do you know there are 300, Kinkhead asked. How do you know there aren't, asked Fleming. Well, there's the Protestant approach to facts, and there's the, uh, you may say, the Celtic approach to facts. And Fleming definitely had a, a Celtic gene in him there. So the trial finishes, and uh, I won't go into the details of what happened there because he had an absolutely ingenious scheme, beating all his colleagues to being the first with the news of the verdict and the sentence. It didn't work by accident, but they all had a good laugh out of it. And Pearson writes as follows. Fleming had more than a week left in Moscow and he tried to make the most of it. With visions, however misty, of a world scoop, he joined forces with S.P. Richardson of Associated Press and applied for an interview with Stalin. You know, Fleming was one of those guys go to the top, you know, he sort of had that kind of background. Quenus was refused in a letter from Stalin himself on the grounds that he was too busy. Uh, they went and asked Litvina for an interview, that didn't happen. And there's this letter which uh, is photographed. Respected gentlemen, Richardson and Fleming, I'm very busy at this moment with uh, important matters and unfortunately I don't have the possibility to satisfy your request. E. Stalin, E for Yosef. Pearson continues. Fleming had done his best. It was time to go. On the night before he left, he shot craps with Richardson for the signed original of Stalin's letter and won. But he took something much more valuable out of Russia. As he sat in the morning of April 23rd, 1933, in that empty Victorian dining car, spending his last rubles on his last Russian meal, with the old grey train scuttling on towards the Polish border, he carried with him memories which were to yield unexpected dividends in a quarter of a century's time. But in 1933, the world of Smirsch and James Bond was not even a minute fragment of his imagination, and life had nothing more exciting to offer than the dull routine of Carmelite Street, that's where Reuters worked, where he resumed his job of sub-editing the inexhaustible flow of copy brought in wire baskets into the great dusty newsroom on the first floor of the Reuters building. How dull. Anyway, and this is where this kind of thing, I think, becomes very useful to people like Fleming because he went back again in 1938 with a trade delegation. He was sent there really by the Foreign Office to, you know, they, he'd been there before, he thought they thought he might find something, find out something useful. And this of course is just typical of the way Britain operated then because all the prosaic people reported, as we well know, that uh, Russia would be finished in six weeks, some gave it 13, you know, there's all sorts of professional opinion in the army as to how many weeks 
Soviet Union would su survive if the Nazis attacked it. And Fleming, the amateur, who knew no Russian, no specialist in Russia at all, had just been there for the Metrovic trial and then a week of this uh, curious delegation, trade delegation. And when he got back, Fleming wrote a report to the Foreign Office. He tried to, you know, suss the place out. That was the purpose of being there. And he had no experience, no knowledge of language, no, hadn't any particular contacts with Russian. But he had a sort of imagination which allowed him to ride over facts. And this is what he wrote, but I will just first read the paragraph introducing it by Pearson, where he says, Considering how short had been his stay, and how meager his sources, the report was a minor tour de force. Bear in mind here, Fleming was, um, you know, 35 years old or something. He wasn't even a, a man of the world, really. He was a, a lighty, as we'd say in South Africa. But it was a minor tour de force. Where facts were lacking, his imagination was more than adequate to fill the gap. His report was written with the fine Buccanesque relish of a man who had found his right element at last. It is hard to believe that it was any more misleading than most of the intelligence reports sent back by genuine British agents at the time. The point is it wasn't misleading at all. And listen to what Fleming actually wrote. Near the end, he gave his own estimate of the Russian soldier. And Fleming, in 1938, when the Russians being written off as wreckage and useless and wouldn't be able to resist the Nazis, he wrote as follows. It is impossible to judge these men by English standards. Their fatalism, their lack of critical standards, their general unawareness are all foreign to our character and a source of exasperation to us. In attempting to estimate their value as allies, we can only say that their courage is high and that the breaking point of their morale is high. British and French liaison officers who may be called upon to work in Russia will be appalled by the task which will confront them. They will be confounded with administrative chaos such as they never dreamt of. They will flounder in a sargasso sea of all red tape in the world. But, when the moment comes for action, they will realise that these tough, grey-faced little men are a vastly different force from the ill-equipped gun fodder of 1914. And once again, how right he was. Fleming had extraordinary insight. He had imagination, that gave him insight. So, he's in the war and he served in intelligence, came across the legends of people like Sidney Riley, who I've mentioned elsewhere, and I think that's the model for James Bond and all that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe not. But in the middle of this, he just loathed the prosaic life of post-war Britain. I mean, he didn't really much care for the prosaic life of pre-war Britain. He liked the war, though. He had fun then. He had to go in 1944 for a, some sort of conference to do with his work in the Secret Service, I won't bore you with the details, and to Jamaica for a couple of days. And so Pearson says, when the conference was over, he and Bryce had to fly straight back to Washington. Fleming was silent for most of the journey, but just before the plane landed, he turned to Bryce and said, I've made up my mind. I'm going to live the rest of my life in Jamaica. Bryce was amazed. He looked for the trip as a failure. Could you please arrange to buy me a good patch of land, Fleming went on. I'll want about 15 acres, there must be cliffs of some sort, and a secret bay, and no roads between the house and the shore. When you've fixed it for me, I'll build a house and write and live here. I'd build a house and live here, except I've got a, a wee apartment uh, within cycling distance. So, his friend Ivor Bryce, arranged all this, um, found a place at Oricabessa. Um, the land cost £2,000, quite a bit of money in those days, but not a fortune. Uh, and he spent another £2,000 building the house, which has became Goldeneye, where he used to go and write the James Bond novels, as we all know. In between the buying the house and starting the James Bond novels, Fleming wrote an article for Horizon magazine, edited by Cyril Connolly. Um, he, uh, describing Jamaica, 
And I think this is extremely interesting as well on the same uh, basis that the Moscow report was. If you burden yourself with the big town malaises you've come here to escape, the telephone, gin and canasta jitters, gossip and how to keep up with the procession, those will be the serpents in this Eden. But if you can leave this triste baggage behind, you will find Jamaica has everything you need for a holiday of 20 days or 20 years, amidst a kindly and humorous people in the most beautiful large tropical island in the world. And Pearson comments, Jamaica was a daydream he could always believe in, an island that seemed unlike anywhere else in the world. It was the one place where he was really free from northern melancholy, free from the promptings of his solid Fleming ancestry. And he goes on to describe various aspects of Jamaica, but this is particularly uh, Fleming-esque. Another old Jamaican myth that he treated as if it were actuality is the story of the cockpit country, known according to him as the land of look behind. He wrote, when taxes were introduced in 1790, the Maroons, the Spanish Negro inhabitants of this province, would not pay. The governor sent a company of redcoats up into the hills to enforce payment, but the Maroons repulsed them, set up their own government and refused allegiance to the crown. They still refuse it, and are the only corner of the British Empire to do so. Their colonel is a coloured man who, with all his government, wears a Sam Brown belt. He does very little governing except to maintain the rights of his people vis-à-vis -vis the governor. His people work and mix with their neighbours, intermarry and come and go as they please. But since they pay no taxes, no roads have ever been built into the province and there are no public facilities, such as post offices and social services. The terrain has never been surveyed, and if you look at the map, you will see a large white patch with red veins of roads coming to a full stop at the perimeter. As Fleming could himself easily have found out, you will look in vain on your map of modern Jamaica for that white patch where the red veins of the road come to a stop. The fact is that Jamaica fitted into that compartment of his mind where truth was not the primary concern. So we come to the concluding passage, and this is really the purpose of this whole reading, because this is the opening paragraph of a short story that Fleming wrote sometime in the modern period, we don't know when, it was never published, and Pearson quotes it, and if uh, his fantasy about Jamaica should be rescued from obscurity, I think this should too, because it really is Fleming speaking. Here is the man whose family come from the, the Angus Glens and who just never quite got accustomed to life in England. He liked Jamaica and he was fascinated by Russia and all sorts of other places, but uh, there's something about the Anglo-Saxon world, workaday world, that he just never got accustomed to. And he expresses it in this little passage. In the early morning, at about 7.30, the stringy whimperings of the piped radio brought visions of a million homes waking up all over Britain, of him or perhaps her getting up to make the early morning tea, to put the dog out, to stoke the boiler. And then will this shirt do for another day, the socks, the pants, the ever-ready, the Gillette shave, the brill cream on the hair, the bowler hat or the Homburg, the umbrella and the briefcase, or the sample case. Then Dodo, the family saloon, out on the concrete arterial, probably with her driving. The red brick station, the other husband, the other wife, the clickety-click of the 8.15 round the curve by the golf course. Hello, Sydney. Hello, Arthur. After you, Mr. Shaka. And the drab life picking up speed and flicking on up the rails between the conifers and the damp evergreens. Bond switched on his electric blanket and waited for his hot water with a slice of lemon and contemplated the world with horror and disgust. Of course, he would not have contemplated it in that way if he'd been, the scene had been set in Jamaica, or indeed here.
my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. <laughs>